Can you imagine selling something for $994 million? Like, what marketing would you use to find a buyer with that kind of coin? Well, today's guest did exactly that, and he's here to tell us exactly how he did it. It's the award-winning Small Business Big Marketing Show, thanks to American Express and Yellow. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing madness. I'm your host, Timbo Reed. You, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Today's 446th episode, it's made possible thanks to digital marketing agency Yellow. If you're ready to get found online and who isn't, then check out their full suite of products at yellow.com.au. And we're also made possible thanks to the very good folk at American Express. To see how your business expenses can reward you, Google Amex Business. Guess what? Big show today. We chat to a Texas real estate agent who listed and subsequently sold America's biggest ranch for just under a billion Aussie dollars. That's with a B, not an M. This week's Jingle of the Week very cleverly congratulates Aussie mums, and you get a sneak peek into a new segment that will help make your clients go, wow. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. With well over 400 interviews with successful business owners sitting idly in the Small Business Big Marketing archive, it seems kind of a pity not to revisit one or two of them every now and then. Whether you're a long-time loyal listener, of which I know there are many, thank you, or whether you've just picked the show up in the last few months, (laughs) what took you so long, I can't help but think The marketing gold shared by guests four, five, six years ago is well worth being reminded of. So that's what today's interview is all about. You know, way back in June 2015, I came across an article about the Wagoner Ranch in Texas being for sale with a price tag of 994 million Aussie dollars. The Wagner Ranch is the largest ranch in the US, covering 535,000 acres, has more than 1,000 oil wells on it, tombstones of long-dead legendary cowboys, as well as a horse standing up. Every ranch needs a horse buried standing up. The marketer in me immediately needed to speak with the agent who listed it. How did he get the listing, and what kind of marketing was he doing or going to employ to find a buyer with that kind of spare change? I quickly did a research, tracked him down. His name is Bernard Ukeritz, and at the time was working for Sotheby's, and he kindly agreed to this interview. Now, don't think just because he's selling a high-ticket item, (laughs) hashtag understatement of the year, the learnings and insight that you're about to hear don't apply to your beautiful business. Trust me, they absolutely do. Now, Bernard is an Aussie by birth, unbelievably, and grew up on a plantation in Papua New Guinea, and he now lives in Texas. So I started off by asking him what took him to the US in the first place. I left Papua New Guinea in the late 80s, uh, 88, 89, and I originally traveled, I was traveling around the world, and I was going to meet a mate of mine in Greece, and um, I got to America and didn't get past go. I I, uh, flew into Kentucky uh, fell in love with it, uh, fell in love with a the girl there, fell in love with the horses there, started playing polo. And, um, you know, 25 years later, here I am, married, four kids, um, and have been really lucky. Let's talk y- your real estate background. You've got an amazing history there. I understand that prior to moving to Texas, you spent some time in Beverly Hills selling some pretty interesting homes, including Jose and Kitty Mendez, who were murdered by their two sons. What was the selling pitch on that one? You know, truthfully, I, I was I was more in the you know Malibu, Hidden Hills, Calabasas area, and Jose and Kitty Menendez um, back in the day, they had a 
uh, a compound in Calabasas, a fairly large compound, and they were um, had just moved into it uh, when they were murdered by their sons, Eric and Lyle. And it was a pretty, you know, world famous case. And, and unfortunately, as bad as it was, it pales pales uh, by some standards today. But it was it was pretty famous and. The property had been on the market for a long time and it was stale and it was stagnant and it was stigmatised, obviously. And I walked into the lawyer's office one day uh, that was handling the case and it you know, took me two or three months to get him to see me and I went in and I gave him a pitch and, and the pitch was, you know, I want a no-holes-barred way to sell the property and um, I'm going to do this, this, this and this and there, if you have any problems with it, uh, let me know now. And he stood up and there was a whiteboard behind him and he said, uh, and he wrote on the board just sell it, do what you got to do. And that was it. And I had it sold, I think, about 90 or 120 days later. Okay, so there's two big questions there because I know myself and my listeners are always so interested in how do you get past the Dobermans? So how did you get that meeting with that lawyer who I'm guessing is just a hard-to-get guy? And you mentioned the, the, the this, this, this and this as the way you were going to sell that stigmatised property what were those points? Well, to get past the Dobermans, as you say, it was just constant calling and uh, there was no email in those days, so it was faxing, you know, and sending packages and just sort of um, barraging the guy until he agreed to see me. You weared him down. Yeah, I wore him out, <laughs> you know, and um, the accent didn't hurt and it was, you know, a different approach and, and that's always been a little bit of an advantage for me over here. Uh, Americans generally like Australians and, and the door is more often open than it is closed uh, because of your passport and your uh, accent. And so I've been really fortunate in that regard. And then with regard to the, you know, how I went about marketing it, um, look, it was a long time ago, but I know it went something like, I want to put out um, press releases that say that the estate must be sold to fund the, um, the law case, that the lawyers want their money, et cetera, et cetera, uh, put the smell of a bargain in the air. And I want to be able to say that if I don't get an offer by X date, then um, I'm going to I'm going to auction it. And auctioning it in this country has a different connotation than it does in Australia. You know, most properties in Australia, when they go on the market, they're up for auction. There's a bid date, and everybody comes by and and generally speaking, you know, bids on the property. Over here, it's a lot different. You you put the property on the market, you market it conventionally, you put it in the multiple listing service. You know, all of those things. Um, auction is is not a huge way of selling property over here, and usually you know, signals that the end is near and there's blood in the water. Bernie, you, you say the smell of a bargain kind of um, overcame the stigma of a house that people were murdered in. Is that really what happened? I mean, who ended up buying it and did they just not care about what had happened previously? The, the family that ended up buying it, I ultimately became great friends with. And really? In fact, partners for 25 years. No. Yeah, yeah, as luck would have it and, um, you know, the great people. But... Um, you know, that sale started a career for me in stigmatised properties or properties, as we say in the business over here, have hair on them, bankruptcies, you know, um, litigation, divorce, you know, estate division, probates, things like that. And that's really what I built my career on. That was kind of the, you know, the, the mainstay of the, the core of my career. I mean, I've done a lot of other things. I've done, you know, developing. and But what you generally have to do with a property that is, stigmatize, you have to re-level the playing field. You have to be 180 degrees different from anything that was tried before. You have to give it a fresh appeal and create some new angles. You have to campaign that property so that from a marketing standpoint, so that you're opening up, you know, new avenues, new ideas and, and, and you know, widening your centric circle of, of buying clients. It's a common theme on this show the past few weeks and a theme that I love, which is challenging the conventions of the category. You know, the old saying, you know, you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Sure. So there's such courage in flipping things 180 degrees, isn't there? I don't know about courage. There's certainly a lot of fear involved, and in my case, fear of failure, and that goes back to a guy that... That's well, courage. Well, yeah, I guess it is. You have to summon it, you know, like the proverbial line. But, you know, fear of failure is, is a great motivator. Uh, when you are born and raised the way I was and, you know, I went to the 10th grade at the Southport School and I did a year out at Longreach Ag College and uh, neither of which really prepared me for America and what I would eventually do. But so I have always come from a place where I haven't been highly educated. I've had to create my own path. And um, 
if you've got a, the pressures of uh, wife and kids and survival and you've got to put food on the table, you figure it out pretty quick. The marketing goodness you're listening to is made possible thanks to American Express. And if there was one card in their suite of cards that I'd love to draw your attention to, it's their Business Explorer credit card, which is a very, very sexy little beast. Here's why. It gives you up to 55 days interest-free on purchases. You earn up to two points for every dollar spent. You can receive 50,000 bonus points if you spend 100 k in the first 12 months. That's not possible for everyone, but maybe your business has that and many expenses go through. Complimentary travel insurance, you can receive a welcome bonus of 100,000 points if you apply by February 4, 2019 and spend $3,000 within three months of your approval date. That's a nice little card, isn't it? To find out more, simply Google Amex Business. Terms and conditions do apply. Check their website for details. Working in Malibu and Beverly Hills or that part of LA, you must have worked with some very high maintenance clients. I'm guessing. I did, and I have, and um, and you continue to. <laughs> and from time to time, I, I continue to. I work with a lot of celebrities, both in front of the camera and behind the camera, as we say over here. What makes them high high maintenance? Well, very often people that either have a lot of money or come into a lot of money quickly aren't always really that well versed in real estate and in the buying and selling and, and generally, you know, transacting real estate. And so there's a lot of hand-holding, a lot of coaching. And in my early days, you know, I, I would sell what most people in Australia would call mansions, you know, whether it was in Hollywood or Beverly Hills or, you know, on the beach in Malibu or in Calabasas, Hidden Hills, that sort of thing. And, um, you know, they were generally a very high-maintenance clientele, uh, lots of... Uh, wealthy uh, housewives and mm. people like that that, um, you know, wanted to have the house that was just that much better than the next person. Do you ever have to pull them aside and say, look, I'm going to get you because at the end of the day, they want the, they want the best price. They want to sell their house. They want the best price. But their high maintenance is getting in the way of you doing that. Have you ever had to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, listen, I'm here to do the best thing by you, but boy, oh boy, are you making it hard, champ? Well, in my younger days... You know, I didn't have that many of those conversations, but I had some. And, you know, I used to bring a lot of people into real estate and teach people, you know, the art of selling and marketing and all that kind of thing. And I would tell people uh, and take my own advice that the best revenge you can get on a bad client is to actually get the transaction done, whether they're a seller seller that doesn't want to sell or are making it hard or whether they're a buyer that's, you know, trying to grind a seller. Uh, The best way to stop taking them around in the car and putting up with them is to, is to get them in a deal, you yeah. know, and uh, and close the deal. You're a gentleman. You'd never have those conversations. Get on with the business. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've definitely been called other things, but... <laughs> yeah. Love it. Well, the accent, they'd excuse you for the accent. Oh, he's from down under. We'll excuse him. Hey, now, listen, let's talk Wagoner. In your own words, let's assume that I've got a lazy kind of $994 million Australian in my pocket. Pitch me the Wagoner. The Wagner is absolutely, without question, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a buyer. Um, it's, his, it's a ranch of historical proportions, uh, legendary uh, in terms of the ranch itself, uh, the political and social uh, prominence of the families back in the you know, late 1800s and the roaring early 1900s, the 20s and 30s. Um, so much legend and lore attached to it. And it is, it's the last of a dying breed. It's the last or, you know, second last, if you will, in America of the great name ranches. You know, there's lots of, lots of big ranches around in America or stations, we call them in Australia, but, but, uh, this one is really special. Uh, firstly, it's over half a million acres under one fence, um, contiguous land, and that's very hard to find. The King Ranch, people say, oh, well, the King Ranch is bigger. Well, Theoretically, it is, but it's but it's also in five stations, which are spread apart. It's kind of like the Kidman place, you know. It's it's over several states, and and it's certainly not in one block. So this is over half a million acres in one block under one fence. But one of the most exciting things about this opportunity is, you know, this family has owned it for 165 years. No part of it has ever been sold. They've been a very private family. There's been much said about fighting and things like that, but it's, it's not all true. A lot of that's blown up by the media. Certainly they have, they've, for 20 years, 
disagreed on, on various things about how to wind up the estate, how to liquidate it, whether one was going to buy the other out, and, you know, all those sorts of things. But when you have a big family, you know, um, obviously there's lots of opinions and uh, mm-hmm. it's wound its way through court for the last 22 something years. And, you know, um, with some good luck and good timing and, and hard work, I managed to um, be the guy that took the deal down. But Yeah, okay, okay. Whoa, 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 <laughs> says the cowboy. Uh, how did you get the listing? Well, uh, like I said, it was it was fortuitous, but it was also a lot of hard work, a lot of, um, as I like to say to people here, at, at times it was, you know, espionage, sabotage, undercover work, uh, you know, all of those, all of those things that, that go into, um, you know, a listing like this. It was a highly charged environment for a start and, um, and had been so for quite some time. I understand that you went to the micro detail, if that's the right phrase, to even sit at the back of the courtroom during the judgments when it was decided should it sell, should it not sell, who's going to be responsible, like you were just there the whole time in the background? Well, you have to be. I was sort of undercover for a year before anything became public and like anything you have to, you know, have to know what it is, you have to research uh, what it is you're doing and and figure out what the angles are and, and um, you know, I was fortunate enough to be asked by first one lawyer uh, associated with the case and then the other uh, to be involved. There was, you know, hundreds of brokers over the years that had put up various schemes and programs and proposals. But I think the, if I could say one thing that got me the deal probably more than anything else uh, was a combination of, you know, uh, tenacity, one, I think, and just um, passion for it. Uh, you know, I'm very passionate about the ranch. I believe in what it is. I believe in what it was. Uh, I want to honour that. And I want to, you know, I believe very much in what it can be in the future. And so for me, when I say to you that the Wagner Ranch is the last of its kind and, you know, I wax on uh, prophetically about all its history and legend and lore, I really mean it. I've researched it. I probably know as much or more about that ranch as anybody today. Uh, and I and I immerse myself in it. But I think, you know, to be to be honest with you and, and to be transparent about it, um, you know, it wasn't Sotheby's, the brand, that got this deal and uh, the receiver, who is my client, uh, and the shareholders, who were sort of secondary clients, if you will, will probably tell you that. And I think the lawyers would tell you that as well. It, it was about, I think what got me the deal was that I cared enough to really go into all of the reasons why this ranch shouldn't be auctioned because the fact of the matter was that the decision had been made by the receiver to auction it. And he had interviewed, you know, uh, no less than seven international name brand uh, companies. But this is the kind of a deal that requires, you know, uh, you to be fleet of foot and it requires tenacity and it requires people skills. And it's not a one size fits all deal. And, um, and I spent a lot of time talking about why an auction was a last resort, not a first alternative um, to this, you know, to this mighty ranch when it had never really been given a chance on the open market. I'm pretty excited to announce that Yellow are a major sponsor of this show, which makes a lot of sense given they're a leading digital marketing agency and this is the leading marketing podcast in Australia. So what is, who are Yellow? Good question. Well, besides it being a very yellowy colour and possibly Coldplay's best song ever, yellow.com.au offers a range of digital marketing products designed specifically for people like you, small business owners on a budget who want to grow. Now, I'm talking about Australia's number one online directory. They can get you into that. They have affordable SEM, that is search engine marketing and search engine optimization packages. Plus they design and build pretty nice websites. I totally get how tricky digital marketing can be. You know that. That's one of the reasons I do this show. So why not let Yellow take care of this side of things for you whilst you focus on what you're good at? Check them out, yellow.com.au or give them a buzz if you're in Australia, 132489 and tell them Timbo sent you. We're talking about a property worth close to a billion dollars Australian. 
Was there a hard business decision that you think secured you the listing? Did you drop your commission? Have a better marketing plan? Well, there was a, you know, there was almost 12 months of uh, meetings and two o'clock in the morning meetings and off location secret meetings with various factions and, and parts of the equation. But ultimately, that all really came down to one day in court. And, and we were literally, you know, Sam and I were negotiating this deal. I think the court hearing was at one thirty in the in the afternoon, and and I think we finally finished negotiating the deal at about ten thirty that morning. It went right down to the wire. I knew that I was sort of in, if if you will, you know, a few weeks before that, but there was still the crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's and certain clauses and things that had to be and provisions that had to be implemented. And it was a big moment, not just for me and Sam, obviously, but it was a big moment for the families. I mean. The one thing about that decision, which both lawyers uh, reminded me of after the court hearing, was the decision to hire me and Sam was unanimous by all the shareholders, all the lawyers, and all the family members involved. And that was a first for, you know, 25, 30 years. Okay, let's talk the marketing. You've got the listing. Who's inquiring? In this country, it's the usual suspects that one would imagine that acquire land of such magnitude and, you know, there's a few of those kinds of people. There's a thing called a top 100 landowners list in this country uh, that's put out every year by one of the local magazines here. And, um, you know, so it's those types of people that, you know, make a career or a, or a retirement career out of acquiring large tracts of land and cattle ranches or buffalo ranches, things like that. Um, so they're what I would classify as the usual suspects. And then you have, you know, entities that are both national um, and international, foreign and domestic, uh, that are looking at it with, you know, different ideas about how to run it and how to leverage the brand and, you know, all those sorts of things. There's people who are in the oil business, obviously, the oil and gas business, in the energy business, and there's people who are in the uh, cattle business, and I would say, you know, cattle and oil and gas are probably, you know, and, and land acquirers are the, are, the, are the top ones. But look, we've taken this to the four corners of the world, as, which is what I promised when I started this. And we've had an incredible number of inquiries, um, you know, almost 700 inquiries at this stage. And, you know, there's a lot of dreamers in there, but, and, you know, and certainly a fair share of scammers uh, and promoters. But, there's some real quality people and um, we're down to a, a pool of about a dozen people at the stage and they're, you know, iconic name type people and then there's some people that you've never heard of. When you get up into that kind of money, you know, you'd be amazed at how much there is out there and what sources it comes from. You, you say you took it to all four corners of the world. How do you actually do that? I imagine something like this doesn't require like some big fandangled marketing slash advertising campaign? I mean, you just, do you quietly make phone calls? What do you do to get it out there? It's a series of things. Firstly, you know, uh, with the Sotheby's International uh, Realty Network, there's, you know, I think 60, it's in 60 countries. There's 16,000 agents around the world. You know, there's 752 or 60 odd offices around the world. So it's, firstly, you know, it's, it's, it's pressing that button and getting out to all those um, franchises and Sotheby's owned uh, locations worldwide. That's number one, and that's probably the biggest. Uh, then, you know, it's it's my own network of uh, private wealth management people, political people, celebrities, sports figures, uh, landowners, people who know landowners, um, you know, all of that sort of thing, a lot of lawyers. So is it phone calls to these people or is it a letter or is it a... It's a, it's a combination. You know, I find the best way is, uh, you know, an email and a phone call. Depends on, you know, who the target clientele is. You know, some might get a packet. Some might get an invitation to get a packet. Some you may not uh, call intentionally um, because you want it to be their idea and you want them to call you. So you'll, you know, you'll pepper the area and uh, <laughs> lay, <laughs> lay the trap, you know. And uh, What's in the pack that you send? Well, in the pack that I send is you have, you know, lots of pre-qualification, financial pre-qualifications, broker pre-qualifications, confidentiality agreements that have to be sent back, you know, and then it's a drip feed of information from there 
Uh, once people jump through the hoops, they can get into an electronic data room. They can physically come to the ranch. You know, once I say they're okay, you know, financially. So once you do a an inspection with a potential buyer, what is it? You do it in a chopper? Do you hop in a car for, for a week? What's an inspection look like? We call them tours or showings, and uh, it's a combination of uh, my truck uh, or my ute or pickup. It's, uh, you know, the King Ranch uh, truck. And, um, or my partner has a suburban and, uh, you know, we've got sort of a three, four hour highlights of the compounds kind of tour, which is sort of a quick zip around during the day. You can get out in the chopper for an hour and a half or two hours early in the morning, uh, for the most part. Uh, and then if there's more of sort of a, there's an eight, nine hour tour and there's a three day, there's a three day program as well. So it just depends on sort of the, hmm. the interest level of the buyer and, and, um, what it is they're looking at the ranch for. Now, I understand you're looking down the barrel. I think I read somewhere of a commission of around $7.2 million. What are you going to do when it settles? Well, firstly, I don't talk, I never talk about commission, but what... I knew you'd say that. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. Uh, whatever it is. It's, it'll be well earned, as I've said. Uh, yeah. You know, I just keep uh, doing what I do, which is, you know, more of this. You know, I'm, I've got other things that I do, uh, I'm a court appointed receiver for another ranch that's non related. Uh, I have other deals in the pipeline. Uh, I have things that I syndicate. And, um, you know, I'm looking at one or two really special deals internationally at the moment um, that I'm really willing and able to take on after I close the Wagner. But right now, the focus is on the Wagner. Every guest that appears on the Small Business Big Marketing Show, something wonderful happens. They either get some media coverage or, you know, asked to speak somewhere. I may well introduce you to the buyer of the Wagoner. You know, funny things have happened. A- any chance of a cut? If you're licensed and it's legal, I'm happy to oblige. Probably be legal. The license thing's an issue. I'll head out today and get that sorted. <laughs> yeah, print one up and I'm sure we can work something out. Good on you, Bernard. Are you on Twitter so people can hit you up? Uh, no, mate, I, I really don't have time for Twitter. <laughs> I'm a social media kind of guy, like I said. I'm I'm a little bit different. I'm a little bit old fashioned. I mean, you're talking to a guy when I started real estate in California, people didn't use computers. They didn't have laptops. Um, you know, we had a, we had a machine that looked like an old type, typewriter with a paper roll in it, which was our multiple listing service. You sound like you, uh, you miss the days of the fax. Some days I do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when your voicemail fills up and you, your email's overflowing. Sure. Bernard, thanks so much for sharing the insights into certainly the most expensive uh, product that I've ever spoken about on the show and, and good luck with the sale. Well, there you go, team. Gun real estate agent Bernard Ugaritz. Now, as a side note, the Wagner Ranch did sell for an undisclosed sum to Stan Cronkey, an American businessman and sports team owner, including he owns, he owns a company that owns English Premier League team Arsenal and the NFL's Los Angeles Rams. He's got a bit of dough. He's valued at $8.5 billion, according to Wikipedia. And his wife is the daughter of Walmart co-founder James Walton. There you go, a bit of trivia for you. Hey, be sure to hang around after my top three attention grabbers as this week's Jingle of the Week is an absolute cracker, one of my favourites. But first, my top three attention grabbers from that chat with Bernard, thanks to digital marketing agency Yellow, and American Express. Attention grabber number one, wear down the Dobermans in order to get to the decision makers. I've written a blog post on how to wear down the Dobermans. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can find that out. But I know they're a pain. I know the Dobermans kind of scare a lot of us business owners when we're trying to get to the decision maker. It is possible. Bernard says just wear them down. Attention grabber number two, Show more passion than your competitors in order to get the deal. Our dear old friend Keith Abraham talks about having purpose with your passion. I totally agree with that. Passion by itself is a bit unguided. But just show more passion and you'll win more often than you lose. And attention grabber number three, and I love this one, be a handshake kind of guy. In a world that spends too much time online, the idea of face-to-face contact, a bit of networking, handshaking, It's got to be a good thing for your soul and for your business. That's what grabbed my attention. Love to know what grabbed yours. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 446 and let me know. Oh, wow. 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 Oh, wow. 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 Good 
Did someone say something? <laughs> now, if you're wondering what that was, that's the intro to a new segment I'm launching next week. It's called Wow. I mentioned it last week, and in it, I'm joined by past guest Steve Sims, who owns the Bluefish in Los Angeles, which is a concierge business for the very well-heeled. Basically, Steve's job is to get his members anything they want, and he does that very, very well. Now, in each WOW segment, Steve and I will be sharing one simple idea that will make your clients go, WOW! (laughs) And that will make you, the small business owner, dangerous. Here's a little teaser of what to expect. Now, guys, you would have heard me mention the fact that there is a new segment starting very soon. Well, it's actually starting next week. It's called WOW, and joining me in each segment from across the other side of the world in Los Angeles is past guest Steve Sims, who's on the other line. G'day, Simsy. Hey, how you doing, pal? I'm good, mate. I love having you back, and I know my listeners will also love having you back. You've been on the show twice. Just remind us, you run a business called The Bluefish. What is it? Uh, it's basically where rich people go to give themselves really cool cocktail stories. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, I will put links in uh, the show notes for this episode because you reveal some of those cocktail stories in the interviews I've done with you. One of the things that you're really big in at Bluefish, and so am I, is wowing clients, right? What, what, do you, what is wowing? What do you love about it? Well, I think wow is the necessity. It's the lifeblood. Now, uh, if someone can just turn up and purchase a walk away, then Amazon's just sitting there lurking, waiting to replace you. Wow is when there is an emotion created in the transaction, when it takes it outside of merely signing the check and creating an experience. And that's what I think we all need to be focusing on today. Couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, as I've said many times before on this show, there is we, we, everyone operates in an extremely competitive industry. There's no shortage of marketing blokes. There's no shortage of accountants. There's no shortage of plumbers. So what is going to set us apart these days? And wowing your clients is a major way of doing that, right? Oh, absolutely. There's there's always going to be competition, but the good thing about competition is it puts people's eyeballs out looking for the best. And the way that you're going to be the best is by standing out and creating wow. Great. So this segment, it's called Wow. Steve, you and I each week, month on, month off, are going to share one idea that listeners can use immediately to wow their clients, right? Oh, we're going to we're going to do some nuggets. We're going to make you dangerous. I love that. What a good outcome. I wish I'd thought of that. We are going to make you dangerous. That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to have their competitors going, why weren't we doing that? Yep, that's what you want. That's what's going to happen. Love it, buddy. And the important bit and what I love about you and what you do at the Bluefish is it's practical. It's real. There's no BS. This is how you do it. Go and apply it. No excuses, right? I've been doing it for years, doing it with uh, billionaires and zillionaires around the planet. If it works for me, then it sure as hell going to work for you. Brilliant, buddy. Steve Sims, that is him over there in the City of Angels. And starting next week, the first segment of WOW will appear. Can't wait, Simsy. See you soon, pal. I think you're going to love that segment. In fact, I know you will. It starts next week and it's made possible thanks to our great friends at American Express. Righto, it's time for the advertising jingle of the week. We haven't had one for two or three weeks. This one's from 1978 and is for Meadow Lee Margarine. Now, I love this jingle for three reasons. One, it's part of my childhood. Two, it's ridiculously catchy, like any good jingle should be. And three, it very cleverly, in its lyrics, overtly congratulates the key purchase decision maker in the home. A lot to be learned from that. Here it is. That broccoli sure looks good to me. Your pumpkin mum is something to believe. And as for that potato, I've never tasted greater. You ought to be congratulated. Your cherry pie's the apple of my eye. Your chocolate cake would make a grown man cry. And I must say, your scones are absolutely bonza. You ought to be congratulated It's not what you make, it's how you make it The proof of the pudding's in the tasting Your garlic bread is said to be a spish And dad's kebabs are up there with the best 
You ought to be congratulated. I love that. It's stuck in my head now for the rest of the day. And, you know, it is copywriting genius, that ad. A lot to be learned. You can watch the full ad over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 446. And you, you ought to be congratulated. <laughs> I can't see. That almost wraps up episode 446 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, sponsored by American Express and digital marketing agency, Yellow. Search Amex Business to find out how your business expenses can reward you, and they absolutely can. And check out yellow.com.au. They're a digital marketing agency that's there to help small business owners just like you get found online. Got some great interviews coming up, plus the WOW segment starts next week. Be excited, team. Be very, very excited. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, interviews like you've just heard with Bernard, some even better. If you love the Small Business Big Marketing Show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it for them. Thank you for that. Until next week, I am Timbo Reid. Always have been, always will be. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing Bye for now.